My topic is the incarnation, and I love the topic. Uh, we're sitting over there. Darlene and I have uh, one of those doorbells with a camera on it, and her phone vibrated a few minutes ago, and she elbowed me. There's a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, I, I wanted to feed the audio of this message through our doorbell to them, <laughs> but the JWs really weren't in a mood to listen, so they moved on. But the topic, the incarnation, this is the truth that God is incarnated in human flesh in the person of Christ. Christ is the eternal Son of God who became man, meaning that He became truly and literally and authentically human in order to save His people from their sins. He is truly God, and in His incarnation, He became also truly human. There's no truth that is more basic to the Christian faith. This whole doctrine is stated with extraordinary clarity and with stunning simplicity in the first 14 verses of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, Jesus is truly and eternally God who became truly and perfectly human in order to redeem the fallen human race. And if you don't believe that much or if you refuse to confess it, object that it is objectively and definitively true, then you're not really even a genuine Christian. Quite simply, Jesus is eternal God incarnated in human flesh. And in fact, the name Jesus literally means Yahweh is salvation. And He was given that name because He is God incarnated as a man in order to save His people from their sins. And again, that is basic Christianity 101. However, it is by no means an easy or foolproof doctrine to master. A thorough and orthodox biblical understanding of the Incarnation is actually one of the most complex and exacting of all theological issues. And yet, on this issue, it is also important to be precise and careful how you think of it, how you speak of it, and how you teach or write about it. It's a doctrine that is beset with pitfalls and peril. In fact, more heresies have been spawned by sloppy thinking about the Incarnation than practically any other topic in biblical theology. Even before the canon of Scripture was complete, some serious, soul-damning false teaching on the Incarnation was beginning to metastasize in certain sectors of the church, and that is what motivated the Apostle John to write in 2 John 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. And so, a denial of the incarnation is the, at the heart of anti-Christian theology. If you study historical theology from the start of the church era, one of the first things you will notice is that a number of serious heresies hover around this doctrine, all different kinds of heresies. In fact, most of the heresies that have assaulted the church from the apostolic era until now involve errors regarding the incarnation of the Son of God. It's a doctrine that is fraught with potential error and misunderstanding, partly because human hearts are congenitally depraved, but the difficulty is multiplied here because, let's be honest, many aspects of the incarnation are simply inscrutable. It's full of mystery. When we say God became man, we are confessing that an eternal, infinite, self-existent being took the form of a finite mortal creature. So, in other words, infinitude is cloaked in a seemingly finite vessel, and that's a reality that is really too big for any finite mind to wrap itself around. And so, we have to start by confessing that there are aspects of this doctrine that we simply cannot fully grasp and explain, but nevertheless, because this is what the Word of God teaches, 
we affirm the truth of it by faith, pretending that we can fully comprehend what is ultimately incomprehensible is a guaranteed pathway to serious doctrinal error. You, you can't unscrew the inscrutable. And when it comes to the incarnation, there are loads of dangers on every side. To make matters worse, the errors tend to be subtle, and they are easy to fall into. Here's a short list of some of the notorious heresies that have arisen with regard to the person and work of Christ. You've got Docetism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, Monophilitism, Monophotism, <laughs> you can't even say that one, Mon Monophotism, whatever, <laughs> also known as the more easy to pronounce Eutychianism. You got Ebionism, Monarchianism, Adoptionism, Patropassianism, Sibelianism, Tritheism, Canoticism, and there are at least that many more. I won't keep trying to pronounce them for you, but here's my point. Don't ever be tempted to strike out as an amateur and cobble together a homemade Christology of your own. If you've not thoroughly studied the history of Christological controversies, you're really not equipped to or, or qualified to propose your own sort of homebrew answer to the mystery of the Incarnation. You'll almost certainly fall into one or more of those errors. And don't be naive about this. Christological heresy is a very real and present danger today, even in the best of churches. In fact, within the past decade or so, at our, my home church, Grace Church, we had a couple of laymen who announced that they had figured out the mystery of the Incarnation with a scheme that they were pretty sure nobody else in the, in the history of the church had ever seen quite as clearly as they did. And they wrote a little book explaining their view and sent me a copy with a cover letter in which they said, and I quote, quote, our research has not produced one theologian or expositor who has agreed with the thesis of this book. That was my reaction, too. Here's a clue. <laughs> in theology, that's virtually an ironclad proof that your thesis is probably wrong. Anyway, these two guys insisted that during his earthly ministry, Jesus always functioned purely and exclusively as a man. So they said that he acted only in accord with his human nature and never once displayed any aspect of his deity. They didn't openly deny the deity of Christ or the essentials of Trinitarianism, but they, they dogmatically asserted that Jesus never acted as God at any time from His birth through His death on the cross. In fact, I'll quote from them for you. This is from their book. This is the rationale of their view. They said, quote, if Jesus used His own divine power at any time, He would be disqualified from being our example and there would be no substitutionary atonement or righteous life which God could impute to us, unquote. So in other words, they were convinced that the incarnation actually placed a limit on Jesus so that if he at any time had acted as God or employed any of his divine powers, he would have compromised the genuineness of his humanity, and therefore that would have disqualified him from being a suitable sacrifice for us. Now, pretty much every elder in our church and every seminary professor at the Master's Seminary who looked at this theory told these guys, you're wrong. But they brushed off all of their critics and they self-published that book that outlined their view and they, they sent copies of their book to every seminary library that they could find an address for. As far as I know, they didn't get any traction from that, but they did manage to confuse some of their fellow lay people in our church, and I know that because for more than a decade, I regularly had to answer questions from people who were confused by what these guys were teaching. They claimed that their views were supported by Philippians 2.7, where Paul says, Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men. And they said that verse means that he completely laid aside his divine prerogative. He voluntarily gave up his right to act as God while he lived on earth, and therefore they insisted during his earthly ministry at no time did he ever make any use whatsoever of his divine attributes. 
So in other words, they said he completely laid aside the use of his divine power, his infinite knowledge, his incommunicable, all of his incommunicable attributes, his omnipresence, his authority, etc. And he put a hold on all of that, they claimed, for the entirety of his earthly life. And so far as his works were concerned, they said, he always acted only as a natural man, sin, sinless, of course, but otherwise, functionally, they said he was only human. Never did he act as God. And so they claimed when you see Jesus performing a miracle, raising the dead or whatever, he's not doing that by any native power of his own, they claimed. They said he's employing the power of the Holy Spirit as if that were an alien power to Christ, which is in itself an error. They also said that when Jesus seemed to have supernatural knowledge of things that normally are hidden from human understanding, that was not an expression of divine omniscience, but that was a prophetic revelation that was made to him in the moment by the Holy Spirit. And so when John 2.25 says, Jesus had no need that anyone bear witness concerning man because he himself knew what was in man, they said, well, that's not really a statement about Jesus' divine ability to see past the outward appearance. They said it's the Spirit revealing to Jesus what was in the hearts of other people. Now, that is a version of the canonic error, canonic doctrines, the idea that Christ basically divested himself of his divinity in order to become fully human. The word comes from actually the Greek verb that describes the self-emptying or the self-humbling of Christ in Philippians 2.7. The Greek word is kinoo, and it does mean to make empty. Canonic doctrine then takes it to mean that Christ literally emptied himself of the attributes of deity. Now, to be fair, these guys insisted that, yeah, they believed Jesus was still God in human flesh, but they were insistent that at no time on earth did he ever act as God or make use of his divine attributes. And their whole theory hinged on the claim that Jesus' deity was strictly put on hold, completely subdued, totally quashed, and entirely set aside during his incarnation. And they said his divine characteristics had to be set aside like that or he wouldn't have qualified to be our substitute and our mediator. Well, that's a serious misunderstanding of who Jesus is. And I pointed out to them that what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration really destroys their whole hypothesis. Because on that occasion, Jesus clearly put his divine glory on full display. That was the whole point of that event. The Apostle John was there on that mountain, and that is the very thing he's describing in John 1.14 when he says, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. What Jesus revealed to them was divine glory. He was clearly acting as God. And John, the Apostle John brings up the subject again in the second verse of his first epistle. And this time he writes, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. There he is affirming the full deity of Christ by acknowledging that Christ is the source of life itself. Again, he's saying that the transfiguration was a vivid display of Christ's deity. Peter was there on the Mount of Transfiguration as well, and in 2 Peter 1.16, he refers to himself, as, uh, himself and the other disciples who were there that day as eyewitnesses of Christ's majesty. So now, think that through. Christ had no majesty that pertained to his human nature. Isaiah 53, 2 expressly says, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look on him, nor appearance that we should desire him, talking there about his human nature. So what Christ did on the Mount of Transfiguration was to pull back the veil of his humanity in order to reveal his majestic glory as God. And of course, that's not the only thing. At other times, Jesus forgave sins, and that, of course, is the prerogative of God alone. Mark 2, verse 5, when those men let the, their paralytic friend down through the roof, Mark writes, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. 
And then the next two verses say, some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming because who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, the fact is they got it, and they were right. Jesus was, on that occasion, acting as God. And in order to prove it, he pointed out that, you know, anybody could mouth the words, your sins are forgiven. But healing a paralytic, especially if you do it merely by speaking the word to him, that would show that Jesus did indeed have authority to forgive sins. And so he turns to the paralytic and says, get up, pick up your mat, and go to your home. And Mark says the guy got up immediately and picked up the mat and went out before everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. And that is part of the point. Many of the works of Jesus were works that no human ever has or will perform. He was proving that he did indeed have the authority to forgive sins, and he was expressly and emphatically acting as God. Now again, Jesus is truly human, and He is truly God. Both of those statements are true in equal measure. There's a YouTube video that some of you may have seen from, I think, one of the Ligonier conferences, and during one of the Q&A panels, John MacArthur says, Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. And R.C. Sproul interrupts him to say, well, I prefer to say, He's truly human and truly divine. Actually, they're both right. It's fine to say that Jesus is fully divine. In fact, Scripture uses precisely that kind of language to describe Him. Colossians 2.9, for in Him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. And in that very same sense, He is also fully and thoroughly human. Hebrews 2.7 says, in order to be the perfect sacrifice for sins, he had to be completely human. He had to be made like his brothers in all things, Hebrews says, fully and completely human in reality and not in appearance only. And so the truth is, either way you say it, it's true. He's fully and truly human and fully and truly divine. I understand why Dr. Sproul preferred the word truly, but it's nevertheless true that Jesus is fully, completely, genuinely human, and when you combine that affirmation with the statement that He is also fully divine, I think it's clear enough that you're not claiming that Jesus was only or exclusively human. He was indeed fully human in the sense that He wasn't lacking any of the traits that define us as human beings. His humanity wasn't a mask that obscured a non-human nature. He was human to the core with a fully human nature. And the actual point, either way you say it, is that Jesus' humanity was not a pretense or an illusion. He was a true man. He was human in all respects. He was fully and authentically human. He's also truly God, eternally self-existent and immutable and omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. He possesses all of the attributes of deity. In other words, he's not some kind of demigod. He's not just partly divine. He's not a created being who has been elevated to divine rank. Nor did he lose any of the features or prerogatives or attributes of deity in order to become human. He is fully and eternally and immutably God. So, let's ask some of the hard questions. How can Jesus be omnipresent and also incarnated in a visible, material human body? How can we say He is omniscient when Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 32 both record that He said, no one knows the day or the hour of His return, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And also, Luke 2.52 says, as an adolescent, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. How could He increase in wisdom if He's truly omniscient? And if He's omnipotent, why does Scripture say He grew weary and hungry? How could He be crucified and die if He is both omnipotent and eternal? And the answer to all of those questions is actually quite simple. And yet, it conveys a truth 
that is in, incomprehensible. So, but here's your answer. All of those things are true because Jesus is one person with two natures. It's the very thing we confess when we say that He's fully and truly human and He is fully and truly divine. He has a true and complete divine nature, and He has a true and complete human nature. The incarnation actually added a human nature to Christ. It took nothing away from His divine nature. Don't be fooled by that expression that says He emptied Himself. He emptied Himself of all the accolades and, and uh, praise that is worthy to God. He didn't empty Himself of any of the divine attributes. And those human weaknesses like hunger and thirst and weariness, His need to learn and to grow, those pertain to His human nature. They're normal, non-sinful infirmities. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. So, it is true that Jesus had to experience all of those things as a true human in order to be a suitable mediator and a high priest to His people. Again, Hebrews 2.17, He had to be made like His brothers in all things so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So Christ is truly human, and He had to be truly and thoroughly human in order to be a suitable mediator. He had to be made like His brothers in all things. That is, He had to possess all of the defining faculties and features and frailties of true humanity except for our fallenness. His human nature, in other words, had all of the same defining features that Adam had before he fell and plunged the rest of the human race into sin. Adam, you know, was the paradigm of true humanity until he fell. The human nature of Christ had all of the same defining characteristics that Adam possessed at the dawn of creation, and Jesus' humanity did not eliminate or nullify His deity. God incarnate is still fully God by definition. He's immutable. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today forever. So now here's a really hard question for you. If Jesus is immutably God, yesterday and today and forever, how is it possible that He was advancing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with God and men, like that verse in Luke 2.52 says? And there is only one reasonable, sensible answer to that question. Jesus' eternal immutability pertains to His divine nature, which by definition can never be altered or erased or stripped of any of its attributes. And His growth in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men, that pertains to His human nature and the progress He made from adolescence to adulthood. Here's some other difficult questions. Was Christ still omnipresent when the infant Jesus was placed in a manger? Did the divine mind of Christ know the precise day and hour of His return, even when He said, no one knows, not even the Son? Was the eternal Son of God still omnipotent, even when they had to compel Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for Him to Golgotha? And was the Son of God really immutable, even while He was growing from infancy to full manhood? And the answer to all of those questions is an emphatic yes. Hebrews 13.8 pertains to the immutable divine nature of Christ. He is the same indeed yesterday and today and forever. His divine nature was in no way confined or altered by the addition of a human nature. Here's how John Calvin said it. He said, quote, the absurd notion that if the Word of God became incarnate, He must have been enclosed in the narrow tenement of an earthly body that's sheer petulance, for although the boundless essence of the Word was united with a human nature into one person, we have no idea of any enclosing. The Son of God descended miraculously from heaven, yet without abandoning heaven. He was pleased 
to be conceived miraculously in the virgin's womb, to live on the earth and hang upon the cross, and yet he always filled the world as from the beginning. Here's what's most important to understand. The divine and human natures of Christ are united without change or conflict or confusion or contradiction, all in one undivided person, but two natures. And the theological term for this, you know, I'm sure, the hypostatic union. One person with two natures. And Christ's humanity is real. It's not an illusion. His full deity is in no way changed or diminished by the addition of a human nature. All the attributes of God are, uh, are fully intact in Christ, and in fact, all the attributes of both natures are fully intact in one person, the God-man. And furthermore, the divine nature of Christ is not and never was confined in or restricted by his human body. To quote from the Heidelberg Catechism, the Godhead is incomprehensible and everywhere present, and therefore it must follow that the divine nature of Christ is indeed beyond the bounds of his manhood, which it has assumed. Humanity was added to the eternal deity of Christ. Nothing at all was subtracted. This is standard Christian doctrine. This is what Christians have confessed for two millennia. Listen to Athanasius from his seminal work titled On the Incarnation. He's writing about this very subject. 1,700 years ago, Athanasius writes, the word was not hedged in by his body, nor did his presence in the body prevent his being present elsewhere as well. When he moved his body, he did not cease also to direct the universe by his mind and his might. No, the marvelous truth is that being the Word, so far from being himself contained by anything, he actually contained all things himself. Existing in a human body to which he himself gives life, he is still the source of life for the whole universe. His body was for him not a limitation but an instrument so that he was both in it and in all things. At one and the same time, this is the wonder. As man, he was living a human life, and as the Word, he was sustaining a life, the life of the universe. As son, he was in constant union with the Father. Not even his birth from a virgin, therefore, changed him in any way. So, Christ is manifest in bodily form, and at the same time, he is also omnipresent. That was true during his earthly ministry. It is true now and ever shall be. Quoting from the Westminster Larger Catechism, quote, the Lord Jesus Christ, being the eternal Son of God, of one substance and equal with the Father, in the fullness of time became man, and so was and continues to be God and man, in two entire distinct natures, but one person forever. Now, remember that the apostles saw him ascend into heaven in bodily form. Colossians 3, 1 tells us that Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. In fact, that's one of the confessions of the apostolic creed. He, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He ascended bodily. He dwells in bodily form in heaven even now, and yet he is simultaneously present with us. So you see what I mean when I say these are truths that are simply too large for the human mind to comprehend, but it is absolutely vital that we recognize and affirm and hold in our thoughts both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Don't ever become imbalanced in either direction. Now, I want to further answer the claim, because it comes up frequently, the idea that during his earthly ministry, Jesus never manifested his deity in any way. You often hear some of the TV preachers say that same thing, claiming that he lived his life always and only in a way that Adam might have done if he were not fallen, and that you and I could do if we had enough faith. That is a false idea. But there's a germ of truth that underlies the hypothesis. In order to serve as our proxy, our substitute, both in his obedience to the law 
And as the one who bore our sins under the outpouring of God's wrath, Christ did indeed have to be a true human. That was the whole point of the incarnation in the first place. There had been angelic appearances in the Old Testament where where heavenly beings and Christ himself occasionally appeared in a kind of human form, but it wasn't real humanity. It was a, that was a, a, a simply a, a, a pre-incarnate appearance that looked human. But the whole point of the incarnation, according to Hebrews 2.13, which, by the way, quotes a phrase from Isaiah chapter 8. It's a prophecy that refers to the children whom Yahweh has given to me, And then the next verse in Hebrews 2 makes this argument, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. And then it's just a couple of verses later where Hebrews 2, 17 through 18 goes on to say that he had to be made like his brothers in all things so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest and so on, and so that he could be tempted and and understand temptation the way we feel it. In other words, because he is both divine and human, he is uniquely qualified to be the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And notice that verse stresses the man Christ Jesus. He is our mediator. But he is that perfect mediator precisely because he is both God and man. Nothing in Scripture ever suggests that his atoning work would in any way have been compromised if he displayed his the attributes of his deity during his earthly ministry. But on the contrary, Jesus' miracles actually served precisely to put his deity on display in a vivid and undeniable way. Remember in John 14 when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, he was not denying the necessary distinction between God the Father and God the Son. We know that from everything else Scripture says. But what he was doing there was pointing out to Philip that all of the signs and wonders he had done in their presence constituted a vivid display of divine power. They had seen him do the works of God. He had demonstrated graphically that he was of the very same essence as the Father. They are indeed distinct persons, but they share one undivided undivided essence. And then two, two verses later in John 14, 11, Jesus goes on to say precisely that. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. It's his, his way of saying we share one undivided essence. Otherwise, he says, believe because of the works themselves. In other words, I share the same essence as the Father, so you've already seen the works of God in the things I've done. Believe on that basis. And it's significant that all of Jesus' miracles, all the things that he did to display his divine power, all of them were acts of charity or healings of other people. He didn't do miracles for his own benefit. He didn't use his divine attributes to escape the trials and the hardships and the sorrows of earthly life in a cursed world. He was, after all, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The point is, he never used his divine power to magically make his own life easier. As one esteemed theologian has pointed out, Jesus wouldn't have really experienced the true human struggle if he had availed himself of his divine omniscience while he was taking his ninth grade algebra exam. Indeed, we are expressly told for that very reason that he grew and learned like any other young man except without sin. And in fact, I would say that one of the main and most important ways Jesus rendered obedience to his Father's will was by accepting the normal limitations of our non-sinful infirmities. That's why when Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread, although he certainly had the power to do that, and despite the fact that he had not eaten for 40 days, and it would not have been contrary to any law of God for him to turn stones to bread, and on other occasions, he did miraculously produce food 
He did it when he fed the 5,000. He did it when he made breakfast for the disciples on the shore of Galilee, and yet he refused to satiate his own hunger by a self-serving miracle. He never used his divine powers to make his earthly life easier or more comfortable. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So there is a germ of truth in the assertion that he lived his life with the full experience of all of our ordinary human limitations and weaknesses and inconveniences and the afflictions of human existence in a sin-cursed world, hunger and thirst and exhaustion and all of that, but that doesn't mean that he never manifested his deity, because he certainly did, just as it was important for him to demonstrate his true humanity. He was, had a very good reason for putting his deity on display. He was calling people to trust him not only as a human deliverer, but as their Lord, John 13, 13, he says to the disciples, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. Matthew 12, 8 and Luke 6, 5, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's an explicit claim of deity. Such a claim naturally requires proof, which Jesus gave by healing on the Sabbath in defiance of the Pharisees' man-made rules. And in doing that, he was both asserting and demonstrating his deity. And the religious leaders of that time clearly understood the point. In John 10, 31, they picked up stones to stone him. Here's how John's gospel describes the scene there. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And the Jewish leaders answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man made yourself God. Now, that was true. He was a man, and he did declare that he was God. Jesus doesn't contradict the charge. He doesn't say, no, no, I'm not claiming to be God. I'm acting purely as a man empowered by gifts that God has given me. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, verse 38, though you do not believe me, believe the works, implying, again, these are divinely wrought miracles, and they prove that I do indeed share the very essence and all the prerogatives of God. In John 14, 1, he says to the disciples, believe in God, believe also in me. And when he spoke of himself as an object of faith like that, he was clearly not speaking as a mere man. And there's more. Jesus received and even encouraged worship in his infancy. Scripture tells us, Matthew 2, 11, that the Magi fell to the ground and worshiped him at his tri- triumphal en- entry, the end of his ministry. Crowds of people lined the streets saying, Hosanna in the highest, and those are words of praise and worship. So Luke Luke 19, 39 says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They thought this was blasphemy. They're showing him worship. But far from scolding them, Jesus said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would cry out. And when Jesus walked on water, Matthew 14, 33 says, those who were in the boat worshiped him. A woman anoints his feet and wipes them with her hair. And here too, the, the Pharisees are indignant, but Jesus not only receives the act, he commends her for it and rebukes the Pharisees. There's a scene in Revelation 19 where the apostle John is spoken to by one of the angelic figures in the very throne room of God. So this is one of the highest of angelic beings. And John writes, then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow slave with you and your brothers who have the witness of Jesus, worship God. Never, ever do you have Jesus refusing worship or discouraging the people who fell at his feet like that. People often fell at his feet, and he always blessed them. When he did that, he was acting as God. Now, to be clear, when Jesus manifested his deity, his human mind and will always remained in submission to the will and the example of his Father. And that's why in, in John 5, 19, he says, the Son can do nothing from himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. And then 11 verses later, 
John 5.30, he says, I can do nothing from myself. I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, the Arians and Jehovah's Witnesses and others who deny the deity of Christ all point out those verses and say these are justification for our views. They think the statements that Jesus makes there prove that he simply wasn't using any power of his own when he performed miracles. And they insist that what Jesus is saying is that the power by which he did everything he did was an alien energy that was specifically granted to him by God the Father, transferred to him via the Spirit, they claim, and it was not his native power. Here is proof, they say, that he was not acting as God when he did those miracles. Well, context is everything if you want to interpret those or any other texts accurately. And in between those two statements that I just quoted, Jesus gives a long discourse about his own power and authority, and here's what he says. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father." He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the Son to have life in himself, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, and those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So, notice what all is there. He declares that just like the Father... He has power to raise the dead and grant life, verse 21. He says he has unique authority to execute judgment, verses 22 through 29. He affirms his own aseity, or his underived self-existence. He has life in himself, verse 26. He goes on to assert that he himself is the proper object of a true Bible believer's faith, He's the rightful object of worship and faith, verses 32 through 47. And all of that, every verse there is a plain declaration of his deity. He's declaring his full equality with God the Father. His deity and his humanity are both highlighted every time Scripture deals with the truth of the incarnation. You can't even say what the incarnation is about without stating both doctrines. Christ is God in human flesh, and neither side of that equation is in any way secondary to the other. In fact, here's Colossians 2.9 again. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. That's definitive, isn't it? The word bodily tells us this is about the incarnate Christ. Far from being set aside or subdued or muffled or mitigated in any way, all of the fullness of deity dwelt in him as a man. And the context is important here, too. This is the heart of Paul's message to the Colossian church. The opening chapters, two chapters of this epistle, reiterate this same truth over and over. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he created all things. Nothing was created without him, which means he himself can't be a created being. He continues to hold the universe together. Again, that truth is echoed in Hebrews 1 verse 3. He is the radiance of divine glory and the exact representation of the divine nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. There is no more powerful statement of the deity of Christ than that. I always tell people, if the Jehovah's, come, Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and you're inclined to try to argue with them, take them to Hebrews 8. They have their 
you know, ready-made supposed answers to John chapter 1, most of them aren't prepared to deal with Hebrews chapter 1, especially verse 8, where God the Father addresses Jesus as God. Colossians 2 verse 3 also, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in his incarnation then, Christ was not only perfectly human, he was also the best and final revelation of God to humanity. He was the chosen means by which God declared himself most fully to humanity. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him is what the, I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. The Greek word there means he's exegeted him. This is a key aspect of Christ's earthly mission, to manifest God to humanity in a, a way that's more clear, more personal than any Old Testament theophany or angelic being ever could have done. So, are we clear on this? Jesus is both truly divine and truly human. He is one person, but He has these two natures, and they are perfectly united in an inscrutable hypostatic union that not only enables him to be a sacrifice and a substitute of infinite value to save his people from their sins, but it also equips him to be the perfect mediator between God and men forever. Neither the deity of Christ nor his humanity is in any way impaired or diminished or deactivated by the incarnation. And that's why I don't object to saying that he is fully God and fully man. His humanity was not a diminished humanity. His deity was not abridged or restricted in any way. And don't ever listen to anyone who tries to pit the two natures of Christ against each other. Don't imbibe any doctrine that stresses one side of the hypostatic union to the exclusion or the depreciation of the other. Christ's deity and his humanity are equally essential to our understanding of who he is. Now, I realize I've spent most of my, if not all of my time, answering an error that stresses Jesus' humanity at the expense of his deity. I actually think the more common error most of us usually have to deal with is we're inclined, I think, even in our own minds to think more of his deity almost to the exclusion of his humanity. And so I want to get a, give a word of caution about that as well. Because the New Testament is full of reminders that Christ's humanity is as vital as his deity. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. Now, that, of course, is talking about the deity of Christ. He's passed through the heavens. He's God's own son, meaning he shares the very same essence as the Father. But then the ne very next verse is the one that says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, this stresses on the fact that Jesus is that perfect mediator. He is a sympathetic high priest who, in the words of Hebrews 2.17, has, was tempted in everything he suffered, and so he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And now, before we close, I want to talk about that. Let's talk about Christ's temptations, because this is a major aspect of his humanity, for him to be tempted in all points like we are, people sometimes ask, well, does that mean that he struggled with sinful desires? And in fact, in recent years, at least on the districts of Twitter or X where I hang out, it's become fairly common to hear people try to argue that if Jesus was really tempted in all points like we are, then he must have felt the pull of homosexual desire or lust for some kind of carnal gratification or, or whatever evil desire someone wants to justify. That is not what this means. And I want to be clear, anyone who seriously suggests that Jesus grappled with evil desire that emanated from within himself is guilty of a horrible blasphemy. 
Hebrews 7.26 describes Jesus as holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He himself said of the tempter, he has nothing in me. There were no sinful cravings in Jesus that the devil could exploit. Don't ever think that way. So then we have to ask, what does this text mean when it says he was tempted just like we are? Well, understand first of all that what Jesus went through was the most acute kind of temptation. He was tempted in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry after a 40-day fast when he was in a weakened and hungry condition, and the desire Satan appealed to on that occasion was not a sinful lust, but rather the intense hunger that any of us would feel after a 40-day fast. Jesus nevertheless resisted the devil's enticement and defeated him simply by using the Word of God. He was tempted just as intensely, I think, at the end of his ministry in the garden when his soul was in utter agony. And on that occasion, Jesus was struggling with the same kind of sense of dread and trepidation that any of us would feel in the face of inescapable suffering. Satan tried to exploit the horror of facing the wrath of God, and Jesus overcame the temptation then by submitting His human will to the will of His Father. And the point is this, Jesus' temptations were real and earnest, passionate struggles. It makes nonsense of Scripture to suggest otherwise. The temptations of Christ were powerful spiritual wrestlings, and He was, in te- he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And people frequently then raise the hypothetical question of whether Christ could have sinned. So let me answer that one for you. He could not because He would not, because He is totally pure, and there's nothing in Him that would ever incline Him to sin. He is, after all, God. And Scripture says in 2 Timothy 2.13, He cannot deny Himself. Titus 1.2, God cannot lie. Habakkuk 1.13, his eyes are too pure to approve evil. There are things God cannot do, and top of that list is sin. Now, I realize there's a long-standing debate among Protestant theologians about this, but frankly, I don't see how anyone can deny the impeccability of Christ, even hypothetically. The idea that he might have sinned seems rooted in the same set of false presuppositions that, that makes someone claim that if Jesus had acted on His divine prerogative, He would have compromised His standing as a true human. Jesus could not possibly have sinned as God because He's perfectly righteous. Sin is utterly and completely abominable to Him, and He is the same yesterday and today and forever. However, don't underestimate the reality of the temptations Christ faced just because He was without sin. And in fact, the temptations Jesus faced were no less powerful than the ones you and I face. If anything, I would argue they were probably more powerful because yielding to temptation, like we often do, is easy. Resisting temptation is the real hard thing. The person who yields to the enticement of sin never feels the full force of the struggle. Only the person who resists and resists every temptation always to the very end, he's the one who knows the full extent of temptation the best. Jesus experienced, I believe, a degree of temptation that is unparalleled and unfathomable to us, and yet he held steadfast, sinless, pure through all of it. He experienced the full force of temptation precisely because he did not yield. Leon Morris wrote this about that. To think of Jesus going serenely through life's way with never a ripple of real temptation uh, that would disturb his, his even course is to empty his moral life of real worth and to prevent us from seeing him as our example. His sinlessness 
did not result from some automatic necessity of his nature as much as from his moment-by-moment committal of himself to the Father. He overcame, but it was a real victory over real temptation. And I think that's absolutely right, that you have to see the assault on Christ was an assault on his human nature. And he overcame by moment-by-moment committal of himself to the Father. His human experience was... I think undoubtedly beset with more difficulties and more discomforts than you or I will ever experience. He lived a genuinely human life in every sense. And in fact, let me mention one other text on this issue. Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 9. This is a passage that explains a little more what Luke meant when he wrote that Jesus grew in favor with God. It says this, He, in the days of his flesh, offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became to those who obey him the source of eternal salvation." So what does that mean? Well, clearly, that's about his human obedience. That's about his growth to perfection, first as a child, then as an adolescent, and finally as a mature man. As such, according to Hebrews chapter, or sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, he is the archetype. He is the paragon of true humanity to which God is conforming us all. And when Paul says in Ephesians 4 that we all need to come to the full maturity of real manhood, he's pointing to Christ, the humanity of Christ, as our living example. Now, my time is gone, but before we close, let me quickly note how important it is to be precise in our thinking about the person of Christ and his humanity, because as I said at the start, the pages of church history are strewn with the corpses of heretics who decided that what the church really needs is some novel explanation about the person of Christ. These are not areas where theological novices ought to feel free to experiment. This is one area where the people of God have shared a common understanding for thousands of years, literally. I mentioned at the start that if you study church history, and particularly the early church history, you will learn that during the first three or four centuries after Christ, the church was racked with doctrinal controversy about the person of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, and early heretics all seemed to fall into error on this crucial doctrine. Some of them denied the deity of Christ, some of them denied His humanity, others concocted strange, complex explanations of who He is and how He relates to the Father, and this wide array of different teachings caused a tremendous amount of confusion and discourse among early Christians. The Ebionites insisted that He was a mere man, the holiest of men, but no more than a man. The Apollinarians acknowledged His deity, but they denied that He had a human soul. The Nestorians made him both God and man, but in doing so, they made him two persons in one body, a man in whom the divine Lagos dwelt rather than a single person with both human and divine natures. The Eutychians and the Monophysites, I said it right that time, the Monothelites and Monophysites, they all went to the opposite extreme. They all found various ways to fuse the divine and human natures of Christ into one new nature that was neither divine nor human, truly. The Arians and the Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door claim He's not really God, He's just the highest of all created beings. And most of the Gnostics taught that Jesus' human body wasn't real, it was only an illusion, which was a denial, of course, that He was truly human. Church councils were repeatedly called to decide between these differing views, and as soon as one was settled, another would surface and need to be dealt with. And finally, in the year 451, the Council of Chalcedon issued a statement about the person of Christ that has stood the definitive test, stood as the definitive test of of orthodoxy from that time until now. And in that statement, they said that Christ is, quote, to be acknowledged 
in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. And they said that the distinction of of Christ's two natures is by no means taken away by the union of them, but rather the property of each nature is preserved and, and concurs in one person and one subsistence, which is not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only be, the only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. The genius of that statement, by the way, the, the element that more or less answers all of the incessant heresies on the nature of Christ is found in that phrase with the four negatives. Two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. Those four negative statements forever defined and delimited how the person of Christ is to be understood. G.C. Burkhauer called those four negatives a double row of light beacons, which mark off the navigable water between uh, the two branches of heresy, and they warn against the dangers which threaten on the right and on the left. The fact is, every heresy that has ever surfaced with regard to the person of Christ either fuses or separates the deity and the humanity of Christ, and Chalcedon declared that the two natures can neither be merged nor disconnected. Christ is both God and man, truly man and truly God. He is still both God and man. When we pray to Him even now, we're praying to someone who knows our struggles and shares our infirmities and even was tempted in all points like we are, Hebrews 2.18, Since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he's able to come to the help of those who are tempted. I'll have more to say about that in my message tomorrow where we'll talk about the intercession of Christ. But those are precious truths and a profound encouragement. I can't think of any truth that makes my heart more glad. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that there is a true mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We confess also He is Lord of all, before whom every knee must bow. May we honor both His Lordship and His priestly mediatorial work with hearts that are humble and obedient and with holy lives as You Conform us perfectly to his likeness in perfect humanity. We pray in his name. Amen.